Hey, listener name. And Good. welcome back to the deep dive. Yeah. Ready to dive into a way to maybe work smarter, not harder. Always. Today, we're cracking open EPPI thinking by this performance guru, Guy W. Wallace. Okay. And joining me to uh, break it all down is our expert speaker who knows a thing or two about making things run like a well-oiled machine. Well, that's the dream, isn't it? Always. Yeah. So what's your take on EPI? What makes it stand out from other uh, improvement models out there? For me, it's all about connecting those dots. You know, you see a lot of these other models, they kind of get stuck on the what, like do this faster or eliminate that waste. Right, right, right. But EPPI, it goes deeper. It's asking why. Why are things slow? What's at the root of all that waste you're trying to eliminate? Okay, so how does it do that? How does EPI help us get to that why? Well, it starts with this big idea that everything, everything an organization does is a process. Think of it like a giant machine with all these gears working together. Okay, I like that. And just like with a machine, if you've got one jammed gear, well, the whole thing can grind to a halt. Makes sense. And that's where EPPI comes in. It helps you spot those weak spots, you know, those gears that are out to break before they cause a major meltdown. That's what we want to avoid, those meltdowns. Mm. Now, I love how the book talks about peeling back the layers with EPI. It breaks down into five tiers, kind of like those Russian nesting dolls, mm. but for your work. It's a really clever way to think about it. It is. So walk us through these tiers a bit. All right. So tier one, that's like looking at the whole forest. We're talking about the entire organization as a system of processes. Big picture stuff. Exactly. Then you zoom in a bit with tier two. Now we're focusing on a specific department, like zeroing in on a particular group of trees within that forest. OK, so we're getting a little more granular. Right. And by tier three, we're down to the individual branches and leaves the very specific tasks within that department. So each level, each tier is basically getting more and more micro. Precisely. And here's the really cool part. Each of those levels, from the whole forest down to a single leaf, can be analyzed and improved using this IPPI framework. That's powerful. It really is. So tiers four and five, that's where we really start digging into the how of EPPI, right? You got it. Tier four is where the famous EPPI fishbone comes in. And trust me, we're going to unpack that in detail. Oh, we have to. It's like the tool, right? It's a game changer for dissecting a process to figure out what's really causing you headaches. Love it. And then tier five, that's where things get really meta. We zoom out again, but this time we're looking at those things that help or hinder a process, what Wallace calls the enablers. He has this whole model for it. Oh, wait. It's not just about the steps in the process itself, but all the stuff that goes on around it. You're kitchen on? I'm trying. Right. But before we get too far ahead, let's talk about something that's crucial to any process. The people. Absolutely. Because EPPI isn't just about optimizing for speed or efficiency. Right, right, no. It's about understanding everyone who's a part of the process. The stakeholders. That's right. And what they need to be successful. 100%. And often, different stakeholders have different, even conflicting needs. The sales team might be screaming, we need that product launch yesterday, while engineering is saying, hold your horses, we need more time for testing. And, you know, they're both right. So how do you balance those needs? That's where EPPI shines. It gives you tools to identify and balance those sometimes opposing needs, which is absolutely crucial for making decisions that actually stick. This is already making my head spin a bit, and we're just getting started. We are. OK, so we've got our five tiers. We're thinking about stakeholders. But how do we actually find those weak spots in the machine? How do we even begin to identify those problems that need fixing? That's where this EPI fishbone comes in, right? Yeah. So let's talk about this EPI fishbone. What makes it such a popular tool? Why is it so good for spotting those process problems? Well, I think it's the visual aspect. You know, it's not just a bunch of bullet points. You're actually creating this diagram. OK, I'm intrigued. So picture a fish skeleton. All right, got it. Now, the head of the fish, that's the problem you're trying to solve. OK. And each major bone that branches out, those represent a category of potential causes. Interesting. So what kind of bones are we talking about here? Well, Wallace breaks them down into two main branches. Got your environmental enablers on one side. Yeah, environmental. Yeah. And then your human enablers on the other. Gotcha. So the environmental side, what falls under that? Well, you've got things like data, materials, the tools people are using, heck, even the physical workspace itself or the budget for the project. So basically everything around the work. Yep. That could be helping or, I guess, hindering the process. 
Exactly. Now, on the flip side, you've got your human enablers. This is where you're thinking about the knowledge and skills people bring to the table. Are they well rested, stressed out? Even their personal values can play a role, believe it or not. You know, it's fascinating how EPPI acknowledges that a process problem might not actually be about the process steps at all. It could be the tools are outdated or, like you said, the team's burnt out. That right there, that's causing the bottleneck. Huge GE shift in thinking. And this is where the fishbone gets really interesting. Because for each of those bones, those categories, you're brainstorming specific factors. Okay, so give me an example. Sure. Let's say the problem is projects always go over deadline. Relatable. Right. So under the tools bone, you might have something like outdated project management software or maybe no system for tracking dependencies. So you're connecting those very tangible, solvable things back to that bigger, fuzzier problem right. of projects always being late. Exactly. And you can get really granular with it. Like under human enablers, maybe there's a lack of training on the new project management software. So even though the process, like on paper, looks good, there's this underlying skills gap that's causing delays. Okay. This is making a lot of sense. Yeah. But let's say we've used the fishbone, we've brainstormed, we've got this big, beautiful diagram of all the things that might be going wrong. Now what? How do we actually fix these problems. Doesn't EPPI have like stages of action or something? It does. It has two, in fact. First, there's targeting EPPI, and then you've got your intervention initiatives. Two stages, got it. So it's kind of like going to the doctor. First, they diagnose what's wrong, and then they figure out a treatment plan. Perfect analogy. So stage one, that targeting EPI, that's all about gathering intel. It's about defining the problem really clearly, analyzing those fishbone causes, and then prioritizing. Prioritizing. Yeah, if... figuring out which of these problems, if we solve them, are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. So not just jumping into solution mode, but being strategic about which problems are worth solving first. You got it. Wallace actually talks about this thing called costs of nonconformance. Catchy. Right. Basically, what's it costing the organization or your team or even just you to not fix this problem, and then you compare that to the costs of conformance, what's it going to take to actually implement the solution? So sometimes it makes more sense to just live with a minor annoyance than to go through a huge overhaul of a system that basically works. Sometimes. And targeting EPPI helps you figure that out, and it forces you to define what better even means. Right. Is it faster turnaround time, happier customers, fewer errors? You've got to know what you're aiming for to pick the right path. I'm really picking up what you're putting down. So <laughs> once we've targeted our problem areas, we move on to stage two, those intervention initiatives. This is where we take action. Exactly. And ETPI doesn't just leave you hanging with a vague go forth and improve. It actually breaks this stage down into six very specific phases. I am loving this level of detail. But before we dive into those phases, I think it's time we circle back to something we kind of glossed over earlier. Tier 5 of the EPI model. Ah, yes. The Enabler Provisioning Systems model. It sounds important, but if I'm being honest, a little intimidatingly complex. Can you yeah. break it down for us mere mortals? Of course. Now, it's actually not as complicated as it sounds. Remember how we talked about those enablers, those things that can either help or hinder a process. Right, like on the fishbone, those tools, skills, all that jazz. Exactly. So tier five is all about recognizing that those enablers, they don't just magically appear. They're often the output of other processes, which of course have their own inputs, outputs, stakeholders, the whole shebang. Okay, so it's about tracing those connections back. Mm -hmm. Like if the problem is the tool, maybe it's not the tool itself, but the process for buying and implementing new tools that's broken. Yeah. That's tier five thinking, right? 100%. Tier five helps you see those upstream bottlenecks, those root causes that might be hiding in a totally different department. Maybe the training team is slammed so people aren't getting the skills they need, which then shows up as a problem on your fishbone. It's all connected like a big web. This is why I love these deep dives. It's like we're putting on x-ray goggles and getting this whole new view of how work actually happens. I love it. Okay, so tier five, big picture thinking, I'm with you. But that brings us back to actually doing something about these problems. Yeah. We were talking about stage two of EPPI, those six phases for putting solutions into action. What's first up on the to-do list? Well, before you get too excited and start changing the world, there's phase one, project planning and kickoff. Sounds kind of boring, but important, mm. I'm guessing. Crucial. It's tempting to just jump into action, you know? We found the problem. Let's fix it. But trust me, a little bit of planning up front is going to save you a world of headaches down the line. So it's not just we're fixing this problem. It's 
here's exactly what we're doing, who's in charge, how long it's going to take, that kind of thing. Exactly. It's about getting everyone on the same page about the scope of the project, the timeline, the budget, even little things like communication protocols. Who needs to be kept in the loop? How often? What format do they want the updates in? Those little things can make or break a project. Oh, for sure. Communication is key. Always. So once we've got all our ducks in a row with the planning, then what? Then it's on to the fun stuff. Phase two, analysis. This is where you really get your hands dirty, dive deep into the nitty gritty of the problem. So using our earlier example, if our fishbone told us lack of training is the culprit, we're not just taking that at face value. We're figuring out what training is missing, who needs it, why they're not getting it right now, that sort of thing. You nail it. This phase could involve surveys, interviews, going out and actually observing the work being done, pouring over data, whatever it takes to paint a crystal clear picture of the problem before you even start thinking about solutions. I am all about data-driven solutions. Love it. Okay, yeah. so we've analyzed the heck out of the problem. Now it's solution time. Bring on phase three, design. You got it. This is where you take all that juicy insight from the analysis phase and channel your inner creative genius to design a solution. It could be a complete redesign of the process, developing some new training. Heck, sometimes it's as simple as creating a shared dashboard so everyone has access to the same information. That's where it starts to feel real, you know, mm. like, OK, we're actually going to make things better. But it's not all sunshine and roses, is it? There's got to be a reality check in here somewhere. Always. Phases four and five, those are all about making sure your brilliant solution actually, you know, works in the real world. Phase four is development slash acquisition. Basically, building or buying whatever you need to implement your amazing design. Maybe it's new software, new equipment, bringing in a consultant with specialized knowledge, whatever it takes. And then the moment of truth. Phase five, pilot test. Exactly. You've got this shiny new solution that looks great on paper, but you don't want to go rolling it out across the entire organization just yet. This is where you do a test run, a smaller scale pilot to see how things shake out in the real world. Because let's be real, even the best laid plans can go totally sideways once you involve real humans. Truth. And this is what makes EPPI so great. It's iterative. You're not done after the pilot. Phase six is revision and release. You take those lessons learned from the pilot, maybe tweak the solution a bit, and then you're ready to roll it out more broadly. And then I'm assuming the whole cycle starts again because what works today might be totally obsolete a year from now. You got it. Yeah. It's all about continuous improvement, constantly looking for ways to do things better. I'm exhausted just thinking about it. It's a journey, but it's worth it. And that's the real power of EPPI, you know? It's not a one-time fix, it's a whole way of thinking, a framework you can apply to any process at any level throughout your career. So listener name, if you're feeling stuck at work or you're banging your head against the wall because things are so inefficient, mm -hmm. pick up EPPI thinking. This framework could be a game changer for you. It really could. It's not about magic solutions. It's about structured thinking and being committed to making things better, one process, one step at a time. You said it. And on that note, I think we've earned ourselves a little break. We covered a ton of ground today. We did. But remember, listener name, this is just the beginning. The real deep dive that starts now. Take these ideas, apply them to your own work, and see what happens. Until next time.